Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to look through the CFE specimen paper for advanced hire. For question 1, the energy associated with a photon or electromagnetic radiation is what? At the front of your data book you have the equation E equals HF. This means that energy is proportional to frequency. For question 2, we need to understand the structure of the periodic table. The periodic table is split into four blocks. These blocks are defined by the last orbital into which an electron was placed. We have the S block, the D, the P and the F. If an element X forms an ion X3 plus and contains 55 electrons, this means that the element itself, without a charge, would contain 58 electrons. If this contains 58 electrons, then this means it also has 58 protons which is its atomic number. By looking up atomic number 58 on the periodic table, you will find that it is cerium and is in the F block at the bottom. This means the answer is D. For question three, we need to understand the rules which show how electrons fill within the orbitals in an atom. Looking at the basic electron configuration for chlorine, we have 287. This breaks down further into 1s2, 2s2, 3p6, 3s2 and 3p5. The electron in 3p5 will be the outer electron. This electron has been placed into shell number 3. We can eliminate A and B. Shell number 3 contains three subshells, 0, 1 and 2. 0 corresponds to the S, 1 corresponds to the P and 2 would correspond to a D. We don't have a D subshell and the S subshell is not the outer shell. Therefore we can ignore C and D will be our answer. For question four, we need to use the VSEPR rules. We can see from the diagram that this structure contains four bonding pairs and two non-bonding non pairs of electrons. This gives a total number of electron pairs as six. In the first answer, we have sulfur, which has six outer electrons plus four fluorines minus no charge. This gives a total of five electron pairs, which cannot be the answer. In B, we have nitrogen with five outer electrons plus four hydrogens minus one for the charge, giving four electron pairs. In C, we have xenon, which has eight electrons plus four fluorines minus no charge to give six electron pairs. This must be our answer. For D, we have aluminium with three electrons plus four for the hydrogens minus the charge of minus one to give four electron pairs. In question five, we're looking at transition metal chemistry. Here we have the nitrite ion, which can bind in two different ways to a metal. If it binds through the nitrogen atom, then it's the nitro ligand. If it binds through the oxygen atom, it's the nitrito ligand. We can see from the diagram that the ligand is bonded through the nitrogen atom, meaning we can ignore B and D. We then need to look at the two options available in A and C. For the naming, ligands are always named alphabetically. Therefore, pentaamine nitrocobalt will be the name and A will be the answer. For question six, we're looking at equilibrium constant. At the front of the data book, you have the generic equilibrium constant equation. We can use this to write the equilibrium expression for this reaction. Concentration of methane multiplied by concentration of water, which are the products, divided by the concentration of carbon monoxide, multiplied by the concentration of hydrogen cubed. By inserting the numbers which we have in the table and the equilibrium constant that's been given, 3.9, we can rearrange this to be able to find the concentration of methane at 950 degrees. Question seven requires knowledge of weak acids. When you dilute a weak acid, the pH will increase towards 7 as the concentration of the hydrogen ions will decrease. The pKa will stay the same as this is pKa equals minus log Ka and is based on the equilibrium constant for the dissociation of the acid. Ka, the equilibrium constant for the dissociation of the acid, will stay the same as this is the concentration of the hydrogen ions multiplied by the concentration of the anions divided by the concentration of the original acid. This is just a ratio, so by diluting the acid you do not change the ratio. Therefore, B is the answer. To find the equivalence point of the reaction, we need to look at the vertical part of the graph. 
we have to find what pH range this spans. This graph spans between about 2 and 7. This means that we need an indicator which will change colour over this pH range. By using the table in your databook, you can find the pH range for each of the indicators named. Phenolphthalein ranges from 8.2 to 10. Methyl orange, 3.2 to 4.4. Bromothymol blue, 6.0 to 7.6. And bromescal purple, from 5.2 to 6.8. This means that phenolphthalein is out of the range of 2 to 7. Question 9 has us look at a number of statements about acids. For A, 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid solution has a hydrogen ion concentration of 0.1 mol per litre. This is because it is a monoprotic acid. And therefore, for every mole of hydrochloric acid you have, you have one mole of hydrogen ions. B will be true as sodium hydroxide is a monoprotic base and ethanoic acid is a monoprotic acid. Therefore, the moles of OH ions and the moles of H plus ions are the same in 20 ml of 0.1 molar solution of each. For C, the pH of hydrochloric acid at 0.1 molar will be lower than that of 0.1 molar ethanoic acid. This is because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid and ethanoic acid is a weak acid. Therefore, hydrochloric acid will have dissociated more than ethanoic acid will. The pH is then a measure of the H plus ions in solution. D, because ethanoic acid is a weak acid, it will dissociate less than hydrochloric acid. Therefore, the Ka value for ethanoic acid will be lower than that of hydrochloric acid, making D our answer. For question 10, you need to know the definition of the standard enthalpy of formation. This is the enthalpy change for the production of a compound from its elements in their standard states. Chlorine standard state is to be a diatomic gas, therefore A cannot be the answer. Strontium exists as a solid metal and strontium chloride will exist as a solid, therefore B is the answer. For question 11, to have the greatest entropy it requires to have the greatest disorder. As all of these alcohols would be liquid at room temperature, we are looking for the one which will be a gas at 90 degrees. We can use a table in the data book to find the boiling points of the different substances. Propan 1 all has a boiling point of 97 degrees and therefore will still be a liquid at 90 degrees. Butan 1 all has a boiling point of 118 degrees and will also still be a liquid. Propan 2 all has a boiling point of 82 degrees so will have boiled and be a gas. Butan 2 all has a boiling point of 100 degrees so will still be a liquid at 90. Therefore, propan 2 all is our answer. For question 12, we need to take the values from the question and insert them into the equation given. We need to take care with looking at the units. The units for delta S are joules per K per mole, whereas the units for delta H are kilojoules per mole. We need to convert the delta S into kilojoules before we begin by dividing by 1000. We can then take the two numbers and put them into the equation. All of the answers given would be possible answers if you were to use the incorrect numbers or put them into the incorrect places. Question 13 is about kinetics. The order of a reactant can only be obtained by experiment. Knowing the order of one reactant will give you some information, but not all of the information about the speed of an overall reaction. You cannot determine it by the stoichiometry, and it is only part of the sequence of steps in a reaction mechanism. In question 14, we're looking at the mechanism for a reaction. It's thought to be a two-step process, with the slow step being x plus y to give xy. This slow step is the one which will be the rate determining step, and therefore the one which will be represented by the rate equation. This means that we have one molecule of x and one molecule of y participating in the rate determining step. Therefore, the rate equation will be rate equals k concentration of x multiplied by concentration of y. In this structure, we have cis pent 2 ene. This is a cis isomer because the two branches are on the same side of the double bond. The trans isomer will have to have the same structure but on opposite sides of the double bond, giving us D. To tackle question 16, we need to know what the structure of ethine is. Ethine has two carbons which are joined by a triple bond. Each of those carbons is then joined to a hydrogen. In a carbon-to-carbon -carbon triple bond, we have sp hybridization. This means that we can ignore A and B. 
We now need to look at the number of sigma and pi bonds. Sigma bonds form when we have single bonds. There is one sigma bond within the triple bond, and each of the CH bonds are sigma bonds. Therefore, we have three sigma bonds. Pi bonds form when we have multiple bonds. There are two within a triple bond. Therefore, D is our answer. Question 17 looks at conjugation. Conjugation is where we have an alternating series of single and double bonds. We have two molecules, one colourless and one pink, and we need to look at their degree of conjugation. The colourless molecule has a small degree of conjugation that we can see starting from the C double bond O into the benzene ring. The pink version has a larger degree of conjugation, moving from the C double bond O into the ring and then further on around the structure. This means that the colourless form has less conjugation than the pink form, so we can ignore B and C. For something to be colourless, then this means the gap between the HOMO and the LUMO must be of energy which is greater than visible light. This means that the molecule must be absorbing in the ultraviolet, and therefore A is the answer. For question 18, we need to know the definition of a nucleophile. A nucleophile is attracted to regions of positive charge. It will have either a negative charge or a lone pair. Looking at the answers, we have sodium, which has neither a negative charge nor a lone pair. We have B and C, which both have positive charges. And then D, which is ammonia. The nitrogen has a lone pair on the N, which will make it a nucleophile. In question 19, we're looking for a single compound which will react with both dilute hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. For this to be the case, it will need to contain a basic group to react with hydrochloric acid, and it will need to contain an acidic group to react with sodium hydroxide. The first answer is phenol, which will be slightly acidic. This might react with the base, but it will not react with the acid. The second answer is an amine. This will react with an acid, but not a base. The third answer contains an acidic group, but no basic group. The final answer contains NH2, which is a base and will react with an acid, and COOH, which is an acid and will react with a base. A tertiary haloalkane, much like a tertiary alcohol, is one in which the halogen group is joined at the branch point of a structure. This means there will be three R groups attached to the carbon on which the halogen is attached. In this first answer, we have three halogens attached. In the second answer, we have three R groups attached to the carbon on which the halogen is attached. For question 21, we need to understand bond angles and the role that different hybridization has to play in this. Where we have SP hybridization, we have 180 degree bond angles. Where we have SP2, we have 120 degree bond angles. And where we have SP3, we have 109.5. Therefore, if we have sp and sp2 hybridization, then we will have planar structures. This can be seen in p, where we have a benzene ring with one chlorine attached. In q, we have a c double bond, c, with four groups attached. However, these each contain one atom, therefore this will be planar. In r, however, we have a c double bond, c, with sp2 hybridization. However, one of the groups is a CH2Cl. This carbon will have sp3 hybridization and will not be planar. This means that both P and Q are planar, but R is not. For question 22, we are best starting with the final product and working our way back through the different stages of the reaction. We have 2-hydroxy-2-methyl-butanoic acid. This means that running down the middle of the structure, we have four carbons, ending with a carboxyl group at the bottom to match up with the structure above. On the second carbon, we have an OH group on the right and we have a methyl group on the left. This methyl group is the R dash group. The two carbons above will be the other R group. We have CH2 and CH3. We can match this structure up exactly to the one that is in the, the example. We've just replaced the R and the R dashed. Moving back to the middle section, we are replacing the C double bond O, OH group with a C triple bond N. This will create a structure like the middle structure, where we still have the OH and we have the R and the R dash groups replaced with the carbons from this structure. 
we can then move this back to the first structure. We have the carbon which has the OH group attached becomes the C double bond O. We then only have the R and R dash groups attached. In this case, the R, da the R group is CH2, CH3 and the R dashed is CH3. This means we have four carbons with a C double bond O in the second, making this structure butanol. For question 23, you need to use the table in your data book for infrared absorption. Between 3300 and 3500 per centimetre, this is an amine which is not hydrogen bonded. This means that there is no NH bond. Therefore, the only possible answer can be A, as this is the only tertiary amine which is present. For question 24, we're given information about a drug. This drug acts by stopping a patient's immune system. This means that this is inhibiting something in the body and therefore is an inhibitor, C. Question 25. What volume of 0.2 molar potassium sulfate is required to make by dilution with water 1 litre of a solution with a potassium ion concentration of 0.1 mol per litre? To start this question, we need to know the formula for potassium sulfate, which is K2SO4. SO4 having a valency of 2, K having a valency of 1. This means that in solution you have two potassium ions for every one potassium sulfate you dissolve. If we have a potassium ion concentration of 0.1 mol per litre and a volume of 1 litre, then this means that we have 0.1 moles of potassium ions. If we're then to work out how many moles of potassium sulfate this equates to, we need to divide by 2. This means that our moles of potassium sulfate that are required is 0 0.05. The, the concentration that we're looking for is 0 0.2 moles per litre, and therefore the volume will be the moles divided by the concentration. This gives a volume of 0.25 litres. In the question, the volumes are given as centimetres cubed or millilitres, so we need to times this by 1,000 to get 250 centimetres cubed. Thank you for watching my video. Please remember to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos. You can also follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem and Instagram Miss Adams Chemistry for updates on new videos and flashcards throughout the year. Bye for now!